My name is Annika Hansen and I'm presenting on autism and social conversation and we're going to be looking at some of the atypical brain processing that goes on with um, when people um, with autism understand pragmatic information. So, linguists study all different levels of language meaning from the smallest speech sounds studied in phonetics to the grammatical structures of sentences and discourse and the meanings of the words that make them up in syntax and semantics. Pragmatics looks further at a deeper level of meaning, meaning that doesn't come from individual words in order, but rather, rather is inferred from the context and given to the discourse as a whole. So this is things of like our assessment of what's going on in the situation, who's talking, their facial expressions, or listening to their tone of voice or their word and syllable stress. So how big of a deal is pragmatic information to understanding conversation? Well, I have an example here from the Linguistic Society of America of a simple sentence that can have very different meanings depending on the scenario. So first off, Chris and Pat have just been on a really good first date. Um, it went really well, and as Chris is dropping Pat off at home, he says, I really like you. Now semantically, this simply means that Chris really likes Pat. And we know this because we know what the word really means. We know what the word like means. We know that I refers to Chris, who's the subject, and that you refers to Pat, who's the object. But pragmatically, and it's a little bit high up there, but what we know this means because of our general knowledge of the real world, and if you go on a date with someone you want to see them again, it means he probably wants to take her out again. And if you hear him say this out loud, we're able to use his tone of voice and his facial expressions to judge his sincerity and his enthusiasm. So scenario two, Chris actually en does end up asking Pat out again and they've been dating for quite a while now. On the way home from a nice romantic dinner, Pat says to Chris, I love you for the very first time ever. In response, Chris says, uh, I really like you. <laughs> so semantically, this still means Chris really likes Pat, but pragmatically, it almost means he doesn't like her as much as she likes him and this is gonna be an awkward walk home. So what does this have to do with autism? Well, autism is a wide and varied spectrum um, that can totally vary in severity, but the three core characteristics that are pretty much shared with anyone with an autism diagnosis is social deficits, repetitive behaviors, and language impairments. Social deficits can be something like a child that prefers to play in isolation than with their peers, or a baby that prefers to look at objects than their parents face. Repetitive behaviors is pretty self-explanatory. They'll just do something over and over without getting bored. And language impairments can range from someone who's completely nonverbal to someone who at first seems to have totally unimpaired language, but they'll have more difficulty with things like conversation or with understanding pragmatic information. So this is actually what I do at my job, and one of your classmates, Aisha, volunteers there with me. Um, and we work with elementary school kids that have fi high functioning autism and we teach them skills to make friends. So one of those skills is having conversation skills and we'll have to teach them five steps to a conversation. Like you start with a greeting, you say hello, you ask them a question, you take turns talking back and forth on the same topic and at the end you have to make an excuse as to why you're leaving and say goodbye. You can't just walk away in the middle of a conversation. So these are things that you and I might not even think about, they come naturally to us, but there's something that someone with autism might have to be explicitly taught. Some of these social deficits and language barriers come from the fact that they have not correctly acquired theory of mind, which is our ability to take the perspective of others from the knowledge that other people have unique thoughts and perspectives that differ from your own. The classic example of someone without theory of mind would be a little toddler that covers their eyes and they think that you can't see them anymore. And that's because they don't know that you're seeing something different than they are. And someone that's typically developing will have these skills around three or four years old, but it's something that someone with autism will struggle a lot more to acquire. So let's look at a few different aspects of pragmatics. The first one is understanding figurative language. So irony or sarcasm. And this actually goes well with, um, Dr. Colson was talking about this, how it works properly. We're going to talk about when people don't properly process this information. So when you have fully developed language, you'll use two main cues to judge if someone's being sarcastic. This is our assessment of the situation and environment to determine 
if they're being ironic or sarcastic, so that is situational context, or prosody, which is everything about tone of voice or word and syllable stress, rhythm of speech, and intonation, the rise and fall of pitch over a discourse. So in my next example here, I have, if anybody watches The Big Bang Theory, you'll know Sheldon Cooper is a character who has a lot of difficulty understanding these cues and understanding sarcasm. And he's not a good representation of someone with autism, but he is um, an example that very clearly misses these two cues. So I'm going to show you the first example now. Um, I think she's going to get it up there. Hopefully it'll work. Hopefully I'll show you the first example. He has to break into your neighbor's apartment Where he misses and misses her dirty, per se. <laughs> Give me back my key. I'm very, very sorry. Do you understand how creepy this is? Oh, yes, we discussed it at length last night. In my apartment, while I was sleeping. And snoring. And that's probably just a sinus infection. But it could be sleep apnea. You might want to see an otolaryngologist. <laughs> the throat doctor. And what kind of doctor removes shoes from asses? Depending on the depth, that's either a <laughs> proctologist or a general surgeon. that what he's failed to notice is that she's angry and she's a sarcastic character and that there's nothing in the environment that suggests that she actually needs that medical advice right now and so she's probably being sarcastic but he doesn't notice this in the second example um, at yeah, 147 he fails to pick up on her strong prosodic cues making a joke Hey, Penny, how was work? Great. I hope I'm a waitress at the Cheesecake Factory for my whole life. Was that sarcasm? No. Was that sarcasm? Yes. Was that sarcasm? Stop it. <laughs> okay, so this is exactly what my next experiment looks at. The Neural Basis of Irony Comprehension in Children with Autism by Ting Wang et al. looks at the neural basis um, comparing children with autism to typically developing children when they have to determine uh, a statement as being either ironic or sincere. And they compare the differences between using contextual knowledge and prosodic cues. Um, they hypothesized that children with ASD would be less accurate in determining irony from sincerity and that they would show less air, uh, activity in areas of the brain that were related to theory of mind and mentalizing, such as the medial prefrontal cortex, the superior temporal sulcus, and the temporal poles. And we're going to focus on the medial prefrontal cortex seen here in green. Because they don't have this activation, they were going to show compensatory bilateral, so both left and right sides of the brain, activation of the inferior temporal gyrus. They had 18 um, participants of each high-functioning autism and typical development that were bet uh, boys between the age of 7 and 16 years old. And they presented them with scenarios um, where the speaker could either be judged as being ironic or sincere in their statements. These were shown in one of three conditions. First, event knowledge and prosodic cues, where both helpful contextual information was presented as well as strong prosodic cues. Event knowledge only, where only the helpful um, contextual information was presented but in a neutral tone of voice, and prosodic cues only, where there was no helpful contextual information but they had strong sarcastic voice or strong sincere voice. So this is something like, um, Jack just got his test back, Ron sees the A on it and says, way to go, or Ron sees the F on it and says, way to go. So we can see, I try to do strong prosodic cues, and we know if it's a good or a bad grade. So we have two helpers to let us know if they're being ironic. Um, EKO would just be Jack just got his test back, Ron sees the A on it and says way to go, Ron sees the F on it and says way to go. We only have the knowledge of the good or bad grade, nothing to do with the voice is going to help us. And prosodic cues only, Jack just got his test back, Ron sees the grade on it and says way to go or way to go. We're only using the tone of voice to let us know if it was a good or a bad grade. So they found that they were all actually very accurate in determining irony from sincerity. You can see the percentages here. And there was significant difference in the EKPC and EKO conditions, but no significant difference between the groups in the prosodic cues only. However, they said it's important to note that this is because typically developing children struggle without event knowledge, not that children with autism are better at using prosodic cues than they are at event knowledge. We can see here that they're actually about the same. 
But what's more interesting is the underlying brain processes. And what they found is higher activation in the autistic populations in almost all the brain areas they looked at, except for this one that we're going to focus on, um, the medial prefrontal cortex, which, as you'll remember, is involved in theory of mind. So they showed higher activation um, in the typically developing group um, with that theory of mind prefrontal cortex area. And they showed higher activation in lots of areas in autism, but the one we're going to focus on is the right inferior frontal gyrus, um, which they were showing high activation bilaterally on both the right and the left side, whereas the typically developing group was only showing activation, high activation on the left side. What does this mean? Well, it means that generally um, the stronger activation suggests that the autistic populations are using more attention and effort to successfully interpret irony from sincerity. Another example, another aspect of pragmatics that people with autism struggle with is speaker identity integration. This is things like taking into account that what maybe when you talk to your teacher, it's going to be different than when you're talking to a child or to your peers. Who's speaking matters in what their meaning is conveying. They hypothesize that both ASD and TD groups would recruit overlapping brain regions for processing speaker incongruent and speaker congruent sentences and that they would show compensatory activation in the ASD group in regions in inferior frontal gyrus that were found to be involved in processing speaker incongruent sentences. They had 24 subjects with high functioning autism or Asperger's compared to the control group without, and they showed them sentences that were either congruent or incongruent with th three groups of speakers. This is child versus adult, male versus female, or high class versus low class. And so an example of this is, I cannot sleep without my teddy bear. Um, if we hear a child say this, then it's congruent, because that's a type of sentence that we would expect a child to say. But if we hear an adult man say this, it's a little bit weird. It's not what you would expect them to say, that you wouldn't expect the, uh, uh, that an adult man can't sleep without their teddy bear. So something in our brain is going to tick off and say, that's weird, that's incongruent with my expectations. And they found that in terms of accuracy, there was actually no difference between the groups. They were both accurate um, the same amount of times. But they found activation in the same areas um, that we saw in the last experiment. Higher activation of the medial prefrontal cortex in speaker in, oh, sorry, higher activation of the right inferior frontal gyrus in incongruent sentences um, for the autistic population. Now we've heard of this right inferior frontal gyrus twice now. So why is it this area that's showing higher activation instead of any other area in the brain? Well, what we know about this area is it's often used for processing high level discourse and for updating situation models. A situation model is kind of your mental representation of what you expect to happen and what is happening in a text. And when you hear something like teddy bear, when you expect to hear something else from an adult man, you have to backtrack and update what your representation of that was. So we see here that that backtracking and updating is more effortful and takes more activation from the autistic group than it does from the typically developing group. We also saw from the typically developing group higher activation in congruent sentences of the medial prefrontal cortex, that same area involved in theory of mind. Overall, we can take away from this presentation that pragmatic comprehension is more effortful for people with ASD, and compensatory increased activation in the right hemisphere areas involved with updating situation models is present. They also showed lack of activation in medial prefrontal cortex involved in taking other perspectives. So what does this mean outside of research? Well, if we take into account what we know about how much attention and effort it takes someone with autism to process these subtle pragmatic meanings, we can imagine that in a naturalistic conversation, when there's a lot, else going, a lot of other things going on, and you're paying attention to many different things, and you're not thinking about, oh, is that sarcastic or ironic? That's my only task. Then because they don't have that effort and attention to spend on uh, interpreting pragmatic meaning, they're going to have a lot lower accuracy and they're going to miss a lot more of those um, subtleties than a typically developing person that doesn't take the same amount of attention to do so. All right, any questions? Oh, so in um, the experiment was done in Dutch, 
Um, and they put in the paper there is a high class accent and a low class accent. So um, I think they're a little bit arbitrary, some of their examples. So the example they had of um, the high versus low class is you hear someone like, I have a tattoo on my lower back. That's incongruent with high class and congruent with low class. I know it's a little bit arbitrary, I think. And the other was, I listen to Chopin, which is incongruent with low class and congruent with high class. So I think those to me are a little bit of like personal judgments. So they might be a little bit more difficult, but those are the examples that they used. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, question is a comment. I really enjoyed this. My oh, thank you. On, my husband's on the spectrum. And um, it, this exactly matches and meshes with what we've been trying to untangle about the level of constant cognitive work that he's doing compared to uh, a person on the spectrum. And this causes things like, in, in a pragmatic way, it causes needing to nap a lot, needing to um, be plagued with headaches sometimes, mm -hmm. and um, being puzzled a lot. So he absolutely doesn't catch things or get things like innuendo, sarcasm, all of these. So it, uh, it's really, you, you added some layers of understanding for me on that Oh, today. thank so you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? I was just wondering if you thought, because you have evidence for like, uh, more activation in one area compared to the TD group and then lower activation in the theory of mind area. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the lower activation is because there's too much effort in processing other things that they're kind of overloaded and that's why maybe they don't have the resources so maybe it's not necessarily like a deficit in this theory of mind, it's just that so much more effort is placed on just the regular processing that there's no longer like enough resources I guess to do this sort of theory of mind. Yeah, I don't actually know. I think both of the um, the papers that I read said that it was compensatory, so that they were like um, compensating for that they didn't have that activation. Um, but I think from what I know, and I don't know very much, um, but I think that um, sometimes um, a theory of what autism comes from is a lack of specialization when you're a kid. So they have all these other areas with higher activation because they haven't had a specialized theory of mind, but that is, I don't know for sure, so I wouldn't take that too seriously, my advice. But I think um, just in regards to this, both of the papers said that it was um, uh, compensatory because they didn't have the activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. So, anybody else? All right, well, thank you for listening. <laughs>